Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker and reader today. Not only is she a distinguished professor at the University of Utah, but she is also the current poet laureate of Utah. Um, she is also the author of many distinguished pieces, such as a book of essays titled The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, Intimate, a photo text hybrid memoir, um, Appropriate, a provocation, which aims to examine cultural appropriation, and six books of poetry. Her newest collection of poetry is Nightingale, which reimagines many of the myths in Ovid's Metamorphosis. And her newest nonfiction piece is a book-length essay titled the, B the Broken Country on Trauma, a Crime, and the Legacy of Vietnam. Her work has received many fellowships and awards, such as the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship and has appeared in the New, York, the New York Times Magazine, American Poetry Review, and on National Public Radio, just to name a few. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Paisley Rechdahl. Thank you so much. Is this on? Yes, it's on. OK, thank you so much. So, um, this is a reading that, to a certain extent, you tell me what is going to happen. Um, this is a website that I created as Utah's Poet Laureate. I know I'm going to fall in this chair. I can just feel it happening. Okay. Um, as Utah's Poet Laureate, I was asked to write a poem about the Transcontinental Railroad, which uh, was completed in the state of Utah about 100 miles away from my house, 150 now, almost basically three years ago. Next week is the 153rd anniversary of the Transcontinental's completion, so this is sort of a timely reading. I'm half Chinese, so I was more than happy to write a poem about the Transcontinental Railroad for them. I don't think they understood what they were going to get. Um, <laughs> and so what I wanted to do was think about uniting two different historical events in time. During the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, Chinese workers were eagerly recruited to work on the Central Pacific Line, which was from the west um, towards, towards Utah, uh, because they were considered cheap labor. And after the Transcontinental was completed in 1869, the Chinese were then kicked out of the country or pushed out as gently as possible. And then, of course, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed about 13 years later. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first act that targeted a specific national and racial group from entering the country and lasted until 1943. It was an act that also deeply affected my family on the West Coast because there's a lot of people who were sort of, had to sort of sneak in uh, via fake adoptions, things like that, to the country or were kept out, effectively. Um, so, what I wanted to do by linking them was to think about some of the Chinese migrants that came to the country also after the um, railroad was completed. And I happened to be reading uh, a book of poems that had been carved into the walls of Angel Island Immigration Station, which some of you probably know is the, the Ellis Island of the West. It was the Chinese and Asian migrants were detained, sometimes up to 22 months. One of the poems that I chose, or I should say the poem that I chose to um, use as the backbone of this piece, and I'll show you how it's the backbone of the piece, uh, was written for a, a fellow detainee who committed suicide while uh, at Angel Island. This poem was carved into the walls. It is anonymous, no one knows who wrote it, um, and it is part of a dialogic pair, and I can talk about that later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to play this poem. This will be turned into a book, um, which is coming out next year. And the book divides into half. Um, half the book are the poems that you're going to be seeing here. And the other half is uh, a long, strange essay composed of notes. Each note takes the same title as the poem that it you know, refers to. These notes can be read together as one essay, or they could be read only against the poem. So occasionally I'll also be reading some of the notes that will only appear in the book, um, so you can get a sense of that. So this is the opening. All of this information I gave you is on the About page. Uh, I'm going to play 
Let's just do it this way. I have limited technology. I have closed captioning for all of the videos, and I will be doing that, but it won't make sense for this first video because what I wanted to do was think about, this is A.J. Russell's famous photograph of the transcontinental, east and west meeting to shake hands. A.J. Russell was the um, commissioned photographer for the Union Pacific side of the railroad. Um, and I wanted to think about who was in that photograph, um, and I wanted to have the voices of the people who either built the railroad, continue to build the railroad, or who were displaced by the railroad. As we a dot art a penanita. Tendo voce lo signor. Then you must be vatting to try this. Tendi a chi vuoi te caro. Sole va vatta chi no. Molto tonario. Ma ma te no. A chi si è nei tobi to no. A se. Namita. Qui na mo. Na advance. E this is the sound of a train. Αυτός είναι ο ήχος ενός τρένου. Αποχωρημένοι σε χαρούι, τιλκούν χωρίς γοσίμουι, μπορούν να μην μπορούν να σωσούν, ιαουσάπιν τι φυτιλάει. 千古恨仇，千古恨。思向空，对望向台。未酬作志，迷养土。知以雄心，死不悔。And from here you go to the poem, and every one of these characters、um, translates into a video poem or a documentary poem. So you're going to tell me what you would like to learn about. Would you like to learn about adoption, African American workers, African American porters, archaeological artifacts, biracial 19th century journalists, the Civil War, Chinese death rituals, Chinese descendants of railroad workers, Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese phrase books from the 19th century, cholera, environmental change, gender roles on trains, hobos, Hollywood, immigration questionnaires, Irish Americans, labor unions, land art, Robert Smithson, manifest destiny, mass murder, Mormons, Native Americans, the Plains Indian War, photography, polygamy, prostitutions, presidential impeachment, race relations on the train, the telegraph, LGBTQ lives, tell me what you'd like to know. Also, uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Anything that appeals to anyone? Archaeology. Archaeology. All right, that's nice. That's an unusual one. People don't, this is a twofer. All right, I will read. Um, this is, some of them are videos, some of them are documentary poems. So, the first, this is a part of a pair. Not Fulfill is the title of this, and these are archaeological finds from Leland Stanford's mansion in Palo Alto, California. Um, those of you guys who know anything about Leland Stanford, he was the uh, person who owned the Central Pacific Line, and his mansion basically came down in 1906 due to the earthquake in San Francisco. Hand-painted plaster with floral pattern, French-style rose and gold paper in the dining parlor, sage, green, Venetian glass, German beer pitcher, Japanese Katani teapot and majolica, jardiniers, sofas, bookshelves, brass, rail hooks, hanging pictures, porcelain sinks, two bidets, stained glass window with adorned fenestrations, lampshades, caster wheels, British neoclassical vase with scene of hunters spearing lions, oriental rug, gilded flower pot. Um, and it comes with a second one, and then I'll read the notes that come with it. High ambition. These are actually archaeological finds from Chinese railroad workers uh, in their camp at Terrace, Utah, which is part of the dead transcontinental line near my house. Rice bowl shards of four season pattern, bamboo green glaze stamped with British crown, crosser buttons, metal suspender clasps, dozens of flat cut rectangles of unknown function, small vials of liniment, work boots, bitters, carved bone dice, oil lamp stands and dishes for pine nuts, rock ringed canister with stripe of excrement, bones of jackrabbit, porcupine, duck, dish with half a double happiness on it, lion's cracked face on the bottom, yawning. 
Let me find the notes. I was hoping you'd choose a video because I could find this <laughs> thing, but now it's like all this technology. I'm not good with it. Right. Making my life hard. Okay. Not fulfill. Leland Stanford, a former lawyer from New York State, moved in. I can't read my own thing. Sorry. Apologies. Moved in 1852 with his wife Jane to California during the gold rush and, along with Paulus Potter Huntington, Mark Hopkins and Charles Crocker, established the Central Pacific Railroad in 1861. Stanford served as CPRR president, later acquiring and running the Southern Pacific until 1890, after which he became state governor, finally a state senator in the U.S. Senate. In 1876, the Stanfords purchased a red sandstone mansion in Palo Alto as part of a 650-acre estate they later expanded to 8,800 acres. Many of the workers on this estate were Chinese. The estate was badly damaged in the April 1906 earthquake, which destroyed the main section of the residence. In 1884, their only child, Leland Jr., died of typhoid. The Stanfords used the wealth they planned to gift him to found Stanford University instead to serve the children of California. The campus buildings are composed of locally sourced yellow sandstone and red tile roofs, which were dressed and carved by Italian tradesmen. Everyone leaves a material record. Early in his career, Stanford argued against Chinese immigration, labeling the Chinese an inferior race. During the transcontinental construction, however, he reversed this position and argued it would be beneficial for half a million more Chinese to enter the country. After the railroad was completed, he reverted again, supporting the Anti-Chinese Geary Act in 1892. Stanford died in 1893 from heart failure. Jane Stanford died in 1905, poisoned by strychnine. Today, Asian and Asian American students compose 25% of Stanford University. <laughs> High ambition. One of the striking things about Chinese artifacts along the transcontinental line is their uniformity the same earthenware dishes, the same metal buttons and opium pipes. It suggests the paucity of choice, but also the strong connection workers had to their suppliers along the line. But there are other connections Chinese workers developed. Chinese men were reported to intermarry occasionally with indigenous women, as they were imagined by American law to possess similar racial standing. According to the family history of Sandy Lee, a third generation Chinese Native American, her own great-grandfather, Li Yik Gim, was even captured and adopted by a chief who'd lost his son. Yik Gim remained with his adopted father for years, Li said, eventually being elevated to the position of a minor chief. One orphaned Chinese child named Young Long Sing was reported, uh, reportedly adopted by Shoshone and renamed Sharp Eyes. In the absence of Chinese records in the Central Pacific Archives, then, are Paiute and Shoshone oral testimonies. I am struck by how powerfully one culture can carry the memory of another inside it. One man, Wong Sing, was reported to be fluent in the Ute language and could rattle off from memory every major event that had happened to the native communities along the line. When he died, 60 Paiute elders assembled before the Indian agent's office to commemorate him. Elegy is an insufficient word for the act of sharing grief, this sharing being its own declaration of endurance. I do not know if these men were outliers to their cultures or if they expressed through their actions private sentiments not always shared. Regardless, the fragment of history remains a history. In Terrace, when I raise up a cup shard with its British crown stamped on the bottom, the state historian asks me, how does it feel holding a century in your hand? I remember my grandmother Popo telling me as a child how the British owned shops in Hong Kong had signs reading, no Chinese or dogs allowed. I thumbed the shard. Even 50 years after leaving China, whenever Popo or Gong Gong heard the words British, British uttered, they would turn and curse in Cantonese. All right. Since adoption is on the roster, I will choose adoption, and then you guys can tell me where else you'd like to go. Biracial journalism. Oh, and biracial journalism. Good call. Good call. <laughs> Close eye. When I was five, a man found me on my corner, asked in German if I was hungry. And when I told him yes, he took my hand and led me to St. Dominic's, where there was bread and milk 
and sometimes meet. Where there was Daisy, who snapped her fingers in Matron's face and said that she was sick of looking after little boys like me. She said it in American, but I was German then, and she was not my mother, she said, but pushed a sandwich for me anyway through the gate and made me wear a woolen cap that scratched my ears and wrapped a ribbon through the tears in my knees so my legs wore lines of silk. And she held my hand at the depot where they took us and called me little to the others on the train. But I could hear the whispers by our door each night and feel the cold, hard knob of coin she nodded in her skirt come morning. Silver, for the color of your mother's eyes, she sang as we crossed the plains. But I do not remember what my mother ever looked like. And she taught me a song. And she taught me a dance. And she taught me to speak a piece of poetry to the farmers at the depot where we were dropped and say, mother in American, if a woman ever looked at us. And I thought someone from the crowd would take us both, but one took her and Dan took me. And here I am with the goats I learned to milk, the heavy pail I do not spill, my mouth full of words said the way they like them, so I never get the belt. I have a puppy here and chores all meals. The streets are dirt and when it rains, it comes as mud. There are no crowds, no coins, no ribbons at my knees. They were white, I remember, as the stairs I spend my Sundays sweeping. There is a stain I don't get out no matter if Dan helps me scrub. You have to shut your eyes to a lot of dirt out here, Dan winks, and touches my head, and sometimes calls me son. Close eye. Between 1854 and 1929, over 250,000 children were sent by train from New York City orphanages to the West to be adopted. Charles Loring Grace of the Children's Aid Society implemented and administrated the orphan train as it came to be known, along with the Children's Village and New York Foundling Society. The plan was to decrease the number of abandoned or poor children on the East Coast. According to a 1913 Iowa Anchor newspaper article, quote, homes are desired in both town and country, but they must be good homes where influences are of the best, and under no circumstances will a child be placed with people who wish chore boys or kitchen drudges. Children as young as infants as, as old as 17 were accompanied by nurses and sisters of charity to towns across the Midwest and Texas, distributed to any family who made application. Unlike contemporary adoption practices, many of the parents neither applied to nor were approved by a social services agency. Some children were adopted by passersby or those lured to the station by circular letters. Many children were immigrants or children of immigrants, specifically German, Irish, and Italian. None were African American, as the Children's Aid Organization feared they would be worked as slaves. The orphan train later implemented more regulations, including home visits to ensure families did not abuse their wards. That said, here is one 1890 newspaper account of the open market adoption process in Hebron, Nebraska, that leaves me cold. The greatest contest was for possession of a sweet-faced, modest girl of 14. There were as many as a dozen wanted her. My own Gungun was adopted, twice, the first by my great-grandfather James, so that his wife would have company after he left for America, the second time by my great-uncle Howard, who lived in Chicago and legally claimed Gungun as his son. Once Gungun arrived in Chicago, Howard, Howard put him to work painting vases for a shop, pagodas and opera singers copied from magazines, misty hillsides, scraps of poems. Gungun painted them on soy sauce bottles that Howard then sold as antiques. Most Chinese American families have stories like mine. It wasn't till college that I understood many of my uncles weren't related to me by blood, but paper. Are all families as arbitrary, as fragile? The orphan train only ended after the emergence of organized foster care. Perhaps you wonder what happened to that girl in Hebron. Perhaps, like me, you are afraid to find out. <laughs>
before I go to the biracial journalist, there's one thing that has to happen first. Otherwise, part of it won't make sense. This is the sound of a train. This is a sound of a train. This is a sound of a train. This is a sound of a train. This is the 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 sound of a train. At the 2018 Conference of the Descendants of Chinese Railroad Workers, I take audio recordings of conferees saying one of three sentences. This is the sound of a train. We do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us, and we cannot count all the dead. These lines are for a video project I am completing. For those who speak Cantonese, I record them saying the lines in their mother tongue. I cannot, however, get anyone to approximate the quote from Thoreau. There is no way to say this in Chinese, one man says, shaking his head. My Popo and Gongong, fluent in Cantonese, are not alive. I cannot ask my mother for a translation. My mother does not fully comprehend Ch Cantonese and, I understand, is embarrassed about this, among other things. One afternoon, over lunch, she leans across the table with its pot of tea steaming between us and says she's sorry she moved me as a child from the Asian-dominated Beacon Hill to the whiter enclave of Ravenna. We did it for the schools, she said, but now you are more comfortable among white people than us. The us in this sentence is the slap. There's a little too much emphasis my mother puts on us, the final forceful way she places her teacup by the bowl. Of course, I am not finally responsible for that decision or its attending comforts. I recall an afternoon in high school sitting on Popo's couch with my mother, Popo's friend smiling and staring at me. She's so pretty and white, someone murmurs to Popo and my mother grinds her hand into my knee. Hmm. Now, biracial 19th century journalists. Heart. I remember the boy who called me dirty, and the French women who hissed pauvre petite as I passed on the street. And I remember the girl like me at school, who pasted her face with white paint and blacked her brows to pass, she said, as Mexican. I remember everything for which I was made to feel ashamed. Even the fact my father said I would never make half the woman my mother was because of my heart, which the doctor now calls unusually large. Memory is the weakness I bear on my own. I come from a race on my mother's side said to be the most stolid and insensible, yet feels so keenly alive to suffering. It hurts to hear the words strangers use for Chinese shopkeepers, or watch the Chinamen here laugh when I say I am of their race. I, who but for a few phrases remain unacquainted with my mother tongue. I have the name my English father gave me, and I look like my father. I could be loved if I lived as if I were like him, too. But I prefer the name I have invented for myself. I want the world to see my mother in me, regardless if the Chinese have no souls. I do not need a soul. It is not my soul in question here, in these hot glances, these furious whispers. Why care for love when I do not know if I should love others in return? Love is a white loneliness that swells the heart and shuts me out from pleasure. What is there for one like me to do but wander, a pioneer traveling between west and east, myself the link they threaten to destroy between them? I do not need a name on legal papers. Here is a match. Here is the mirror in which my pale face burns its flickering allegiances. My soul is everywhere on my person. I lose nothing of myself that has not already disappeared. 
Suisun Farr, born Edith Maud Eaton, was a journalist and fiction writer, the daughter of an English merchant, Edward Eaton, and a Chinese mother, Achuan Grace Amoy, whom Eaton met, met on a business trip to Shanghai. Farr worked for a variety of Canadian and American publications, largely writing about the Chinese communities she encountered on her travels. I do not know what, in real life, her relationship was like with her mother, a former slave who as a child worked as an acrobat and tightrope dancer for a Chinese company before being rescued by missionaries. Farr's Cantonese pen name and her stories focusing on Chinese life in the West, however, suggest she saw something of her deepest self reflected in her mother, that, though she could have, she preferred never to pass as white. I first read Farr's personal essay, Leaves from the Mental Portfolio of a Eurasian, just after graduate school. The memories she'd had of racially disguising herself, then of refusing to be disguised, felt distressingly familiar. One anecdote, she relates, of being trapped in a room with a British naval officer who insists she succumbed to his advances made me feel, briefly, like I suffered from vertigo. The essay was published in 1909. One can say echoes, one can say similarities, and one can argue that the insistence on these similarities obscures. The English poem reflects the Chinese, but it is not the Chinese poem. The past is not simply a translation of the present. I can say that at times I feel like far, or that I look like my mother, but my life is different from theirs. We are citizens of different countries. The slap in my relationship with my mother is agreeing that some part of me will never be her daughter. In me, she loses what she's already lost, father, mother, language, culture. Of course, she and I ignore this, pretending that the divisions I've learned to contain within myself don't become unbridgeable when I'm with her. What draws us together holds us apart. I don't think there is a language adequate to express this break at our center, even as my awareness of it helps me see my mother with more sympathy. Perhaps this is about race, perhaps not. But race has certainly made our private experiences more private. Sui Sin Far's name in Cantonese means Narcissus flower. My Chinese name, I refuse to translate for you. I love you. I believe that. It's okay to be. All right, so we have other options. We only have a couple more minutes for this. So I can throw out other things. We've got, again, hobos. We've got cholera. We've got labor unions. We've got Irish Americans, cholera, mass murder. Which one, Hollywood? No. Hollywood, good call. This is one of my favorites. I was like, no, bad choice. Okay. I was like, I don't know that. What? Heroic. Helen Holmes, The Hazards of Helen. Victim? Tie me up to trestle or bridge, I bristle, buck, saw through blunt bindings, swing and shimmy to ease myself down burnished poles, bold, cold, heroic. Lock me inside your clerk's closet, I'll pick its double lock, duck the huckster's ill-timed shot, tackle robbers in the boxcar. Intrepid, I ride astride slender waist rails, uncouple cars, and mount runaways. I turn all tails to heads, begin each film fired, despised, till I solve all crises I alone saw coming. I get my men. My fans are manifests now of different destinies. The West is a dead end for those with frailty inbuilt to their machinery. Men here hit the skids, lost it all on stocks, cows, cards, swats, topped out and constrained by history. But I'm still speculative, exciting, my amplitude, the endless futurity to which my sex has always been traveling. That's why strangers eat me up in the dark, laugh when I grab the robber's mitt, the one snatching at your heartstrings, my leather police. Now I bring my mouth down to his wrist to take a bite that only looks like a kiss. Helen Holmes was an American silent movie actress famous for her titular role in The Hazards of Helen, a Western adventure series of 119 12-minute films that feature Helen, a telegrapher, foiling the plots of dastardly men. The Hazards of Helen was not the only film series made about plucky young women surviving life in the West. 
There was also The Perils of Pauline and the Ruth Roland films Ruth of the Rockies and The Timber Queen. The Hazards of Helen was produced by the Kalin Company specifically to compete with The Perils of Pauline series, which, unlike Holmes's films, featured a female protagonist perpetually in distress. Helen, in contrast, single-handedly overcomes all criminals and calamities. In The Girl in the Game Alone, Helen saves her boyfriend and father from a train wreck, saves the railroad from financial ruin, recovers the train's payroll from thieves, rescues another male character from a lynching, captures more thieves while also saving two men from a mine cave-in, and finally it couples a freight, char freight train to prevent a crash. It is exhausting to watch. <laughs> Holmes, like her film character, was a station master's daughter who grew up around trains and, like Ruth Rowland, performed her own stunts. The Helen Holmes and Ruth Rowland films were extremely popular with men, but they were designed to attract a growing female audience, one that had evolved within a changing nation and burgeoning Hollywood culture. Prior to the 20th century, Western migration in America was largely male. By 1900, however, the number of female Western migrants outpaced male ones. By the time of the booming Nickelodeon business between 1905 and 1914, movies had begun to focus on women in the West, in particular in Los Angeles, a city critics characterized as where Occident and Orient finally met. I doubt my great-grandmother, Ethel, watched these films as she disliked movies, though she herself was the first female telegrapher and shipwright in Seattle. And Popo would also have disdained them, though she'd rescued her own sister from an abusive marriage at age 18. From what I remember, these stoic, exceptional women never met. I suspect if they had, they would have understood each other. Each shared a similar outlook on gender and life, specifically the belief that, though women worked harder than men, sons were more valuable. Popo eventually even transferred her preference for men onto my father, despite his being white. I remember the 80th birthday party my mother threw for her, and how, after opening every present my mother had bought, Popo would turn and thank my father lavishly. These women, too, spent their lives in the West. I do not know why the women in my family so willingly discounted the strength of others like them, or if they truly had so little respect for their own accomplishments. Perhaps it was a form of modesty, more likely it was learned self-hatred. Despite its persistence in popular culture, the ubiquity of the silent film trope of a helpless woman tied to the tracks is largely fantasy. Only two such images exist. Holmes herself paid ironic homage to them in her film, Alas of the Lumberlands, in which she rescues her hapless boyfriend, Tom, grouped and left sprawled like a calf, bound to the track irons. All right, one last one, and then I'll um, play the translation. Is there anything else anyone wants? Hobos. Hobos. Yeah. Another good choice. Everyone loves the hobos. Um, and this one I won't have time, I think, to give you the note for, so I'll say a couple things. I ended up doing a lot of interviews with people who ride the trains illegally. They call themselves riders. But, of course, hobos were... Um, the term that was used right around the Great Depression and um, the Dust Bowl you know, that was going on um, in the early part of the 20th century where the train became a place where a lot of people started you know, traveling illegally on the, um, in order to find work. Um, now a lot of the writers are white, middle class, very well educated, um, but there's also a high percentage of them who are soldiers returning from Afghanistan. Um, one person said it was the closest thing to being in war. And, trying to think about what the train represents as a form of technology that um, is sort of dying out with something that maybe kind of come up with this persona poem. And I have to read this one. It's a little hard to read too, because you're gonna hear why. Dead is what they call a torn up track whose living rails I jumped to bed down in the wells and filled with that hit every trestle steam and dawn like horses at the track I train before the fillies foundered sick they fired the agents vets they fired the riders me I love how in a well you throw with sound until your bare lips start to bleed like canisters of oil I stole inside the train of a nation, what it wants to eat and wear it, what it likes to buy, a ring of bones and jeans, of force. there is no reason why to jump a train except to lose the edges of yourself, the timeline pacing moxie at the track that's beat that almost tears your hands off at the wrist, she was the last to go, pretend and vote, and worthless than insurance, no one rides a racer just for pleasure, no one hops a train if they can take a plane, a car whose engine speed is gauged by horses kept alive in memory for sentiment, I guess there's ghosts of what we were and are, we cannot bear to leave out in the desert where I'm going home, just not right now, instead of moxie, not right now, before the race, she hasn't many left her. You know she trusts you, right? The owner said, then slip me true ground in the shots. Woo! I'll play the last um, 
the last poem, and then the translation, and that is it. And you can ask me questions. Not ash. Not gone, but changed. Not a body erased or born of grief alone, but praise. This country made us grow each another soul, not one for earth or heaven only, but nation, electric, dangerous as a third rail. We, the middle kingdom between white and its opposites, its thousand shades of fissure, our existence would compose into a fantasy of whole. Our bodies built more than a railroad. On my 1919 map, red, black, and yellow veins trace rails lengthwise across the states, the fragile paper splitting at its seams. Like any machine, we translate the magnitude of human force to change. We're history, not silent, not invisible, not a dream, not oil, they told me. The first trains ran on steam. Translation, well, before I play the translation. Over the course of these poems, I have taken the literal meanings that have been translated for me to produce what is a most likely, if not always accurate, outcome. Scholars may disagree with my translation, I do not know Chinese. And since so few people in my family speak it, I know that I will never learn. My family has lost, over time, one of our surest connections to the past. Does this matter? And does it matter I haven't shared the other poem with you here, the second half of that pair carved into the walls of Angel Island? I haven't told you what characters comprise that poem, and though I know it's been translated as its own work, I don't know whether the Chinese would allow me to read across both poems' lines, stitching them together so that the sense of one bleeds into the other. Perhaps the two poems are only complete when read this way. Perhaps each text should stand alone. I suspect both. Regardless, the subject of both poems is the same, the loss, the striving, the hope, the death that is startling and continuous. Perhaps, having read only one poem, you long to know the other. Start over. Grief is but one moment of time. The elegy goes on forever. We cannot count all the dead. This is the sound of a train. Δεν είμαστε επιβάτε στο τρένο εμεί. Στέκει για αρχικόητε κόρε. Σωρέι, ο Πατάχτα τη Μονή των Αγίων. Μάμα δεν μα Αυτό είναι ο ήχο ενό τρένου. It's www.westtrain.org, or you can go to my website, and that will link to it as well. But are there questions about? I mean, I could talk about anything, like the building of the site, the all this. Sort of, I could sort of see a hand. Okay, yes. Yeah. So if you don't know Chinese, where did the poem come from? Um, two things. So the poem literally came from Angel Island. It was it was translated into a book. I mean, it was part of a book of translations of the poems uh, on there. 
But if you're talking about where does the poem come from in terms of my translation of each character, I worked with a Chinese um, scholar on my campus, Dr. Fu Sheng Wu, who gave me, and I wanted a very literal, I said I want the very literal translation um, of each character. And from that, of course, uh, I created another kind of translation, obviously through history and poetry, but then this translation at the end here. Um, so that is essentially how I did that. Okay, so follow-up questions. Uh, some of the words uh, correspond and other songs, so right. that, that's, that baffles me. Yeah. The, 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 the um, uh, archaeology, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the word reward or award. Mm -hmm. uh, was that the translation by your colleague? That was a translation by my colleague. So we'll have to take it up with him. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure this is the thing. Um, he is himself also a translator of poetry. And he, I imagine what he was also thinking about was the ways he would translate that poem too. Uh, and so he gave me also another kind of literal translation that would work with the translation he's imagining for that poem, if that makes any kind of sense. I, I imagine that's probably what's going on. But I don't know. It could be something else. But this is the translation he gave me. So if you've got corrections, I'll take them. You can certainly send them in. I'm happy. And I'll run them past him again. But um, too late now. <laughs> With that one, I can actually go back into the site and fix. Other ones I probably can't because they're in the, in the video. But, but I also, I mean, I'm going to take the larger question, I think, underneath your question, which is, this speaks to something I wanted to get at in the project overall, which is the question of accuracy. Um, and the question of what finally a translation is. Um, you know, there might be more, more conventional ways of using some of these phrases. Um, there may be more conventional ways, I think, of um, doing a, this translation itself. Um, there's, a certain, there's a certain oddity to the poem as um, my colleague told me, uh, that it is a form of regulated verse, but what's unusual, he said about this regulated verse form, is that normally um, the reg it is usually spoken about one's own personal experience, not imagining somebody else's. He said that's sort of a violation of the form. And if I were to actually try to translate this poem into English, I mean, formally the closest thing I would be doing was creating sonnets. So there's a, there's a number of sonnets, but also I'm just thinking about historical translations, like. What does it mean to try to tell a history um, about a, a period of time in which, at least from the Chinese worker side, there are no letters, there are no diaries, there's no written record that the workers themselves produced. So we're always doing a kind of strange historical pro approximation based on fragmentary evidence and what other kind of records have been left around them in order to sort of create an idea of what their experience was like. Um, and I'll show you that super briefly. Um, I ended up going and looking at 19th century phrase books, let me see, um, in order to understand what their experience might be like. So I looked at Chinese English phrase books from the 19th and early 20th century, and I didn't, I didn't change anything, I just took lines directly from there. <coughs> so if the Chinese left very little record that was written on their own, this is what a phrase book that they would purchase in order to navigate life in the United States would say. You know, these are some of the things that you know, go on. And as you read it, you recognize that they have a, a way of imagining uh, a certain type of experience. So it is a kind of way of translating their own experience um, historically, too. But there's something inaccurate. There's always something missing, if that gets to the heart of that question, too, which is that translations are always kinds of approximation, and history itself is a kind of approximation of, of the actual or the factual. Any other questions? Yes? What part of this project did you have the most fun with? All of it, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question because I found myself um, I love research. I just love research. And so as I was kind of working around, I was like, okay, well, you know, there's so much creativity in, in research because you don't know what you're going to find. And, you know, as you're kind of digging around, one thing opens up another thing. And so all of it becomes fun. But I would say some of the most exciting and surprising work was um, walking the transcontinental. All that footage of the railroad, that's drone footage that we got. 
But then also um, there's images from these ghost towns on the dead transcontinental line, which is kind of close to where I live. And that was fascinating too, because you could go out there and they're like, they leave all the artifacts. They just, you know, you, you're allowed to kind of wander through these areas where the different workers were, and you can pick stuff up and you're actually just picking up fragments of, of these people's lives. And it really, it's a sort of shock. And it's a shock to actually go and feel, like go and, and see just how enormous the railroad is. It's just, and everything was done by hand. This was not like a machine <laughs> created kind of thing. I mean, they, these people were digging out with spades, you know, these cuts and these fills. And it's just, it's insane to imagine that they, they did all that. And it feels like you actually start to feel the, the physical presence of these workers. And you, it's just, I don't know, it's kind of awe-inspiring. It's funny because when I was asked to do this poem, I knew I was being asked to write a work of propaganda, which is to say, like, they wanted a short poem talking about how awesome the railroad was. <laughs> um, and they got something very different. I mean, they got, they got a more complex history. But when I would stand on that railroad and I saw just, like, how much work it was and, and could feel that, I was like, you know, it would be kind of a jerky thing to do to make it only negative, to make it, make it simply um, you know, a, a tragedy, because I was like, that discounts the workers' lives, and it discounts what they did. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted to make this a big poem. I wanted to think about the magnitude of that work, and what was this, what was something that would be, like, as much an ode as it, as it thinks elegiacally. And I also tried to change the idea of the elegy itself, instead of it being something that is about mourning, about the idea of the consistency, the persistence of memory. And as we remember, we don't actually always mourn. Sometimes we, we, we celebrate in that. So. One last question. Yes. How, how did you decide on the, the three lines that you had people recite at the beginning and the end? Very good question. So um, the first line, we do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us, um, is from Thoreau's uh, Walden. And Thoreau was sort of a touchstone writer for me. He had very complicated ideas and very sort of, and he kind of went back and forth in his ideas about what the railroad was good for or bad for. And so, I, but I loved that, that line because he also, it goes on to sort of say, you know, the railroad rides over sleepers, Irishmen, you know, <laughs> Poles, uh, Chinese, we, we are sound sleepers, I assure you. So he saw the work of the railroad as the work of assimilation itself. So I knew I wanted that line. Um, the we cannot count all the dead was important to me because um, no one knows how many Chinese workers they had uh, on the Central Pacific Line exactly. And no one knows how many Chinese workers died. A number of them did. But the Central Pacific wasn't interested in keeping records. So it's a sort of dig to sort of say we cannot count them because we didn't want to count them. And we also can't count them because we just don't know how many people did die in the cultural building of this railroad. Uh, because of course that we have to take into consideration the indigenous lives that were also lost and, and, and displaced around there. Um, and what was the third line? I can't remember. Um, this, is the sound of the this is the sound of a train. I just like that. I think, you know, like, that's an easy one. What's very interesting is that um, to, with the different languages that I was working with, some people could sort of say, I can't do this, I can, I can say that. Um, and like Greek was, the like, Greek was like, we can't make this work. But this is a, this is a sound of a train. In fact, any language could do that. But we do not ride upon the railroad; it rides upon us. That was very interesting. What languages could approximate that, and which ones couldn't? Um, mm -hmm. the, so I have um, in the book, you'll get uh, Lakota and Shoshone, and some of the um, some of the lines. And there are additional lines that actually I have in the book that I do not translate at all into English. And unless you know the languages, you cannot access their meaning at all. So there's a way in which there's I use translation itself as a form of resistance, but almost all of the lines that you heard, those three, they do get translated into almost all languages. But if you speak um, Navajo, you'll know that, in fact, the Navajo speaker that opens the poem is not speaking any of those lines at all. Um, and I won't tell you which ones what they are saying. But I will say um, I wanted Navajo to open it up because actually right now the largest ethnic national group working on the railroad to maintain it, because it's always being built and rebuilt, um, are the Navajo. Um, the Navajo Nation is essentially continuing to build the transcontinental for us.
So, that is it. Thank you so much, um, and thank have a good day.